uh, preliminaries for this Sunday school session. I just wasn't sure I was able to handle all of it. I'm uh, thankful for the many prayers that have helped me through my surgery. And I'm doing well, but uh, I weaken awful easy yet. So I'm limited to how much time I can uh, be involved. But I felt like the Lord helped me to prepare the lesson. And uh, I trust that it will be of some benefit uh, to each and every one. I realized in preparing this lesson that uh, <clears throat> uh, it would be much easier uh, to teach this lesson to the young parents. Uh, but uh, recognizing the fact that most of my congregation this morning would be in the more elderly element, uh, it uh, posed a little different uh, uh, picture for me to try to deal with this morning. But it would be of uh, wasted time to uh, try to teach the young ones that aren't here. And uh, so I trust that uh, as I've joined the older uh, crowd, that I may be able to uh, share some elements of truth that will be profitable to you. Having a little bit of throat trouble this morning, so uh, we're trusting the Lord to help me to uh, get this job accomplished. The title of our study this morning is Safeguarding the Home. Safeguarding my home is what we really need to consider it to be for it's a personal matter in uh, defending our uh, responsibilities or performing our responsibilities in our own home, in our own family. <clears throat> I have, uh, across the years in my ministry, I've endeavored to quite often preach concerning uh, the problems that uh, we feel and face in our homes as uh, the enemy of the home is certainly uh, wide awake and doing everything he can to destroy any home that has any principle or any fear of God in their heart. So the first question I would present this morning is simply uh, how can we safeguard our home? I believe there is biblical uh, soundness in the word and that there is a, a number of biblical safeguards that we can find through the word. But I felt drawn to 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 14. To me, this has been one of the most meaningful uh, statements of Scripture concerning the responsibilities of our home. Paul said to Timothy, I will therefore that the younger women marry, bear children, guide the house. And then this is the, the point that uh, I felt was most applicable to our study today, that she give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully. Give none occasion to the adversary. What a responsibility. We recognize that the word adversary describes the fact that we have an enemy who is aggressively trying to destroy our homes. We're seeing it more and more in this day, the divorces, the uh, uh, constant struggle of children having to acclimate to uh, different parents and uh, different circumstances. Uh, even at the uh, present time, uh, we are facing in some of our own family how the enemy is doing his utmost to try to destroy 
uh, one of the grandchildren's lives. And I mean aggressively trying, and the devil doesn't take any back seat for anybody if we are just nonchalant about the matter of saving our home. We must recognize that we have a real enemy today. Even we as older people are not immune to that possibility of the devil driving a wedge of some sort that would bring about a tragedy in our relationship with one another. As Brother Shuey said, the lessons throughout this quarter have been concerning relationships. And uh, indeed, our relationship with the family of God is important. It's good to have Christian friends. It's, it's uh, wonderful to feel like you can go to church and fellowship with people that you have confidence in. And that builds relationships. As we have confidence in one another, we build a relationship with that individual. And it is a most blessed experience to come to church where you feel the love of God and the fellowship of God's people. But one of the greatest concerns of my heart has been the awful attack that our adversary is making against our homes, even in this day and time. Uh, the attack against parental authority that we're facing, the way the government is trying to take control of our children. It's a terrible uh, thing that we're facing, and there's going to be some real battles as we face the evil uh, desires of those in leadership in America that are seeking to take us down the pathway of socialism. We were born of God as America's uh, for our forefathers in America uh, gave us a foundation upon which to build. And America has had the most blessed reality of God's uh, help in our homes and in our lives as Christian people. But more and more, those blessings have eroded because so many have resisted the truth and the principles that they have known and have turned away from obeying God. Tragically, it's affected many in the church as well. If the church had stood firmly the way they should have, I believe we could have saved many situations. But when the church begins to soft pedal the truth of God's word, we find ourselves getting into trouble as far as our relationship with God is concerned. We know that the Bible teaches us that the home is a divinely ordained institution. It was indeed the first institution that God created for mankind. The home, the uh, responsibility of a husband and wife taking on a love for each other that would uh, cherish each other and respect each other and produce a, a family of real character and principle to live a life for God that would not bring reproach upon the parents or upon God. How wonderful it is if you can get your children through their teenage years without suffering reproach and tragedy. I thank God for his faithfulness in helping. My first wife and I had four children, actually. The last one died in infancy. We never got to bring him home from the hospital. But the other three have lived, though Satan tried his best to destroy your pastor that's here now. My son, Alan, uh, was uh, uh, totally submerged in the stream behind the parsonage where we were pastoring. And when wife found him only because a dog was barking ferociously to draw her attention, and uh, she went into the water and rescued him and uh, was unconscious, limp as a dish rag, 
And uh, had it not been for a neighbor close by that heard her screaming, Alan would not be your pastor today. But God had a plan for him. And I, I thank God. I simply refer to uh, that because there are few people that can testify that they never spent a sleepless night over what their children were doing after they got to the age where they chose to do their own thing. I've seen so many parents. I've pastored uh, families where grief and heartache and sorrow just constantly oppress them because of the rebellion of their children. And it's indeed a terrible thing. I've seen enough of it in other lives and homes still. Uh, I, I deeply appreciate that God gave me uh, the privilege of raising my three children, or our three children, and never spending one sleepless night worrying about them, where they were, or what they were doing. Not that they were perfect, they were not angels, but I thank God that uh, we had a wonderful uh, family time, and God has blessed abundantly, and has continued to bless. I, I'm grateful that in my retired years, I'm able to sit under the ministry of my son. I know how God molded him and led him, and it's just been a thrill to see how God is helping him as he labors among us here. The home, indeed, is intended to be the foundation of our society. Without the influence of the home and the church, we're headed for terrible disaster. We must honor God and maintain the fact that uh, our home needs to be strong and united and cooperating one with another in the discipline and the leadership of our homes. I thought about the weather as it turns cold in each fall. We naturally begin to do something to overcome the cold. Whether it used to be when I was a child that we built a fire. And of course, through the years, things have changed, and now we just flip a switch and uh, turn on the heat, whatever form we have it. We've got it easy today compared to what we did back there in the early days. But the idea is that we need help when things get cold. And we recognize that things spiritually have become very cold in our world today. And as the cold winds of evil are currently against the church and anybody that professes to love Jesus, we are going to have to strive to build a fire wherever we are and whatever we're involved in to build a spiritual fire that we will earnestly contend for the faith once delivered unto the saints. Our central truth declares that the Christian home's greatest priority is instilling the love uh, uh, for God as a primary focus. To teach our children and to lead them in what it means to prove our love for the Lord our God. It's one thing to say, I love God, but it's another thing to keep his commandments. The Bible very clearly tells us that. And then it adds that the commandments should not be grievous. It ought to come from our heart and a, a delight to do the will of God. And if children do not see a consistency in our love, many of us have faced the uh, the struggle across the years where Satan tried to entice our children and we had to be careful in discipline that we didn't act in a carnal manner, that we were careful to uh, render discipline and to pray that our children would be uh, teachable and recognize dangers that the enemy is, is causing to try to make them fall. But I'm grateful that 
the Lord is able to help us to establish a confidence in the heart and life of our children. One of the saddest things I ever listened to was a good many years ago when I was president at Penview Bible Institute. I'm the last living member of the board that decided to start that school that we'll be hearing from tonight. And it causes my heart to rejoice when I see how God has wrought wonders in behalf of Penview and the many young people that have gone through there and have gone out to work for the Lord. But there's one memory that still haunts my memory, and that is a young lad that came. I had to take him into my office one day. He needed discipline. He was causing problems. And I sat before him, or he sat before me, and I began asking him questions. And I referred to his parents and something that I was wondering about their relationship. And he said, I don't have any confidence in my parents' religion. Cut me like a dagger. Here we are trying to train and help young people to be established Parents are paying good money to come to put their children in Bible school or Christian day school. And here's a lad that is causing trouble in the school, primarily because he does not have a love or respect for his parents. It cut me to the heart. A situation like that is not pleasant. It's not easy to deal with. I'm thankful that I never had that interpersonal attack. God helped us through some very difficult times during the years I was there. But I thank God that he is always faithful and we can see when problems arise in our relationship with our family that there are times we need to tone down. We need to make sure that we show the love of God We can't teach young people to love God if it isn't evident that we love him supremely. It must be evident to them that our love is genuine, that our talk is not merely a verbal statement that we love God, but that there is evidence that we love him and keep his commandments, do our best to be an example to our children. Our central truth declares that the Christian home's greatest priority is instilling the love of God in the lives of our children. We cannot force love. I'm well aware of that. But I believe that by showing love and compassion, especially in times of difficulty, And sometimes as grandparents, we need to take that issue at hand and try to intervene when there are misunderstandings and there are uh, problems being created in our grandchildren, that somehow we may be able to have an influence upon their lives to instill the love of God, that they will know that God loves them and that we are doing our utmost to serve him with all of our heart. The personal uh, or pertinent principles that are given in our Sunday School Quarterly, there were two of them that spoke to my heart. The one says, the best way for a man to train up a child in the way he should go is to travel that way himself. To lead the way is the key. And uh, indeed, it's a a major problem in this day of materialism to train up our children by example. For too many times as parents, there's too much desire for material things until we sacrifice our time because 
uh, we have to work overtime or two jobs in order to pay the bills. But in doing so, often we fail to realize what a sacrifice we're making when children are not having the time they should have with their parents. When children are free to come home from school and have no one there to meet them and love them and guide them, it produces an opportunity for this adversary to develop a, a, a problem in the home that is many times more difficult than parents know how to handle. We must be an example and be faithful to guide our children and have time. I've heard it over and over again where children were asked concerning what they desired more in their home. And they invariably would say, I just want more time with my parents. Just want more time with my grandparents. And we can get so busy that we neglect our children and our grandchildren in, in a way that causes there to be a, a loss of relationship that is vital in their developing years. The second principle that I wanted to share said, it is unreasonable to expect a child to listen to your advice and ignore your example. What a powerful statement that is. Yeah, it's unreasonable to think that our children are going to listen to what we say and fail to be an example that we need to be to guide them in the way that they ought to go. To fail to be an example to them that what we teach them we are living and striving to be an example to help them to find their way through this troubled world. Our key verse found in Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 2 says, Fear the Lord thy God to keep all his statutes and his commandments, which I command thee, thou and thy son and thy son's son, all the days of thy life. Now when I read that, I couldn't help but go to Matthew chapter 5 and verse 17, which says, Think not, and this is the words of Jesus, when he said, think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. I know there's a problem if we become legalistic and operate only from a legalistic standpoint. But Jesus declares that he did not come to eliminate the principles of the law. It is his desire that they be implanted in our heart so that we do what we do for the glory of God from our heart with a will that says, I want to please God. It's not a matter of feeling like we're bound by laws and regulations. People look at the standards of the church too often and feel like it's, it's legalism and they don't have to listen. But beloved, we need to make certain that our, our desire is to live according to the word of God with a love for his word and a love for the teaching of his word, a willingness to obey God as a attitude of submission to God rather than feeling like it's commandments that we have to obey. Deuteronomy 6.1 says that ye might do them in the land whither ye go to possess it. They were being prepared to go to a land of promise. There were Many battles through their days in the wilderness. There were many discouraging times. 
And the, the Jews are suffering to this day because of the rebellion against the will of God. I read of it continually of Jews that are being mistreated and are hated and despised by many. The countries all around Israel are desiring to destroy the Jews in, in their entirety. The only hope we have is that they are God's people and God has the final say. And so we are believing God to work in that matter. But the thought is that they were going through difficult times, but they had an offer that they are going to possess a land of milk and honey and other things that describe the land of Israel. And uh, when I read that, I thought, indeed, that's so typical to this day. We are all facing some problems. We face disappointments. We face discouragements. But, oh, thank God we have it settled in our heart, I trust, uh, that heaven will be worth it all. And we're traveling through all of this world and its difficulties with the confidence that we're headed for a land where there'll be no more suffering, no more sorrow, no more pain, and no more death. How wonderful it is to know that we are not running this life in vain. We are not traveling in obscurity where we don't know which way to turn or what to do. We have the Word of God to guide us and the Holy Spirit to instruct us and lead us in the way we ought to go. And therefore, we just simply need to keep our eyes fixed on Jesus and let the troubles of life fall by the wayside by the grace of God. The word Deuteronomy literally means second law. And it is because of the fact that it was to a restatement of the covenant God had entered into with the people at Mount Sinai. They had drifted. They had compromised. They turned away from what they knew they ought to do. They wanted to do it their own way and in spite of all that God did for them. And I've often felt as I read concerning the Red Sea experience when God walled up those waters in such a miraculous manner. How could anybody not believe in a God that brought them out of such a situation in such a miraculous manner? What does God have to do to convince you today if you have not settled it in your heart to go with God and be obedient to his word and his will? God has been faithful to restore the opportunity for us to know the will of God and to give us a church where we can hear the truth and, and we can be led by the Spirit. All of this that, uh, that the children of Israel were going through was necessary because those who had made the covenant with God had perished in the wilderness due to their violation of the covenant that they had made with God. It speaks to my heart. <coughs> Pardon me. The problem was they had perished ere they were obedient to the will of God. Leaves a person without any hope. We turn our back on God and his plan and purpose for our life. We dare not break the covenant, the promises that we've made to God over the years, the surrender that we made when we met God in an altar of prayer, wherever it was. Whatever we have promised God, we need to be faithful to follow through on, to live to please God and to glorify his name. Dr. Godmay commented, and it's given in the 
uh, in the teacher's quarterly here, that uh, he com com commented that there are two engines on the train to heaven. The engine of love to pull us and the engine of fear to push us. How is God working to get us on that way and keep us going? Are we following because of his tremendous love for us? Do we really recognize how loving and kind and patient God has been with us? Or are we living and endeavoring to follow God only because fear is driving us? I don't want to go to hell. And that's certainly something none of us want to do. But I trust that there's more to our serving God than being driven by fear but being led by his love and uh, uh, traveling by the engine of love in order to make heaven our home. God intended that every commandment should be faithfully kept. Three generations are mentioned in the word because God assumes that a man will live to see his grandchildren. And God has given me the opportunity to live to see at least 25 great-grandchildren. It's a wonderful thing to get together once in a while, but it's hard to get that many together when they're scattered hither and yon. But I'm thankful that God has helped us to lay a foundation that as far as I know, there is no reason for any one of them to miss heaven. For they are not in darkness that that day should overtake them as a thief. Well, I'm not constantly around them to influence them in the way that I feel like God would have them to go. There's one thing I can do, and that is to pray for my family, my children and grandchildren. Hold on to God for his faithfulness. We know that everyone has a will of their own, but we can pray until God breaks that stubborn will and causes our lost loved ones to awaken before it's too late. And I pray that that will be the case in each of our families. Israel was to be guarded by the belief that there is only one true God. We need to be confident of that today, that we must teach our children and our grandchildren that there is only one true God. Not only was Israel to believe in one true God, but they were also to have a personal relationship with him. You know what relationships mean. You know the people that you enjoy having a relationship with. You feel the love. You feel the warmth of their fellowship. You delight when they invite you to their home for a little time together. There's a relationship that we have a desire to be together and to enjoy each other. And that's what we need to feel uh, with our relationship with our Lord Jesus Christ. We feel the need of meeting him in the morning when we first arise and begin our day, that God's Spirit will guide us and help us to establish a family altar that early in the morning our children know that God is important and is needed in their daily living that they might live to please God and to uh, be faithful to their knowledge of the truth. Israel's national name for God or Lord is what we know as Jehovah and somewhat more uh, well aware of the name Yahweh the, this is God's covenant name with mankind, but particularly with Israel. It refers to God's self-existence and transliterates into the words, I am. 
You remember that simple, I am in the word of God. That's all he had to say to, uh, to Moses, I believe it was. Uh, just tell them, I am has sent you. Well, I may be wrong in that. I hadn't thought of that earlier. But uh, uh, the fact is that the simplicity of it is, is simply the fact that Jesus Christ and the God that we serve is the I am that we can be confident is genuine and real and meaningful in our life that we can enjoy a relationship with him that's meaningful. Following, and what I've done is just pick up thoughts throughout the exposition in the quarterly. Impossible to cover it all in the time allotted. But uh, the writer gave us the thought that God used, in this case, the word Elohim for God, which is a plural form of God, referring to God's plurality of being. We know more clearly from the New Testament teachings that God is a trinity. Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, a triune God. And so we can rightly declare him to be Elohim. The God that is plural has the ability to cover every territory of our life to guide us safely on our journey and get us to heaven. God's intention was that his law would be written in the heart of his people and they would obey the word of God with a willing heart. Parents need to be genuine and consistent in their personal love for God's word. The family altar has been a great way to inculcate the word of God in the lives of their children. How thankful I am for the family altar and my parents that taught me that it pays to have a family altar in the home. When the word of God is central in our homes and defines the atmosphere and the conversation, there will be no place for most of what the world has to offer. Christ is the satisfying portion it is his power that can help us through all the struggles that we face. Changing a world of hate into a world of love starts in the home. May God help us to be that example. I believe my time is gone, so we will allow you to prepare for the next service. May the Lord bless you. Thank you for your attention.